My name is Philippe Almeida. I'm here as the Corporate Security Loss Prevention and, as of last month, uh, Business Continuity Manager of Rangel. For those of you that don't know Rangel, a quick introduction. Uh, heads up, when I was asked to do a presentation on the benefits of being a TAPA member, my first reaction, yeah, I will make one slide, two slides, five, ten minutes tops. And when I went through the details, I was already at 50. So I promise I'll cut it short, I'm going to speak fast. If you don't understand, just raise your head and I'll try to uh, slow down. But anyway, what's Rangel? Rangel, it's a logistics service provider based out of Portugal. It was started in 1980 by Mr. Eduardo Rangel, a visionary with an extremely customer-centric um, access to the business. He started as a customs broker, but then as soon as a client needed anything, his first reaction was, let's do it. Let's build a, a new company, let's build a, a new uh, department, a new uh, business unit. So basically, it started from a customs broker, went to um, RNC freight, uh, road freight, uh, customs warehousing, logistics transport, express deliveries, from A to Z. Uh, it stabilized, and then after 2012, we started expanding. So out of Portugal, grew out into the Africa, African Portuguese-speaking countries, uh, and then started expanding to the rest of the continent. The business structure, it's the customs brokers, road freight, special logistics, RNC, contract logistics, and express. We're already in nine countries uh, with uh, our uh, offices there, but basically do operations all over uh, Africa right now. So Portugal, Angola, Mozambique, Cape Verde, uh, Brazil, Mexico, South Africa, uh, Zambia, and Tanzania. This is the group. It's a logistics group spread across multiple countries with a diversity, a huge diversity of business unit areas. But I wasn't born in Rangel. I was started my security experience first in the public sector, intelligence connected, so with a mindset of fighting crime. You have to go after the criminals, you have to catch the, the criminals. And then I received an invitation to go private. And my mentor at the time, he, uh, he gave me the talk. Uh, he tried to explain me the difference mindset between public security and how you have to approach private security in the business area. And uh, his talk was very interesting, I keep it in mind to this day. You're hunting in the woods, okay? You meet another guy, you're both walking around, uh, you, take a couple, you see a huge bear, a grizzly bear, you take a couple of shots, you're blank, what happens? The bear starts charging at you. You both start running away for your lives. Punchline, in order to survive, you don't need to outrun the bear, you just need to outrun the other guy. Hey, it's the, it's the fact of life. It's the law of the jungle. And with this mindset, I started approaching private security. You don't have to be unstealable, you just have to make it hard enough so that the thieves go steal somewhere else, so that they target somewhere else, and you're protecting your company. You're protecting uh, your assets. That's your role. That's what you have to do. With that mindset, I started learning exactly how to do it, the best way to do it. First thing is that protection must be proportional to risk and effective. It's not worth it to spend 5 million rands to protect an asset that only is worth 5,000, right? So you cannot overburden your operations with security requirements, with security procedures. Otherwise, they won't follow it. Otherwise, it's not worth it. But what you cannot do under any circumstance is the opposite. It's to have security measures that are absolutely ineffective. Yeah, <laughs> the bicycle is chained, sure. Does it prevent anyone from stealing it? No way, okay? So you must, we must be careful not to have this a false perception of security. And for that we need guidance. Because if we are looking only on our own perspective, with our own eyes, we take the chance of putting protection that's circumvented. Yeah, we have barriers, but everybody goes around. We have access control, but it's not followed. Because we cannot think of everything. We cannot predict every scenario. So we are working to protect our 
assets. We are working to protect our entity, but we have narrow sighted. We have to be open to all risks and make sure we don't assume we are doing the right thing just because it's our vision. In security, as all of you as security experts know, we must have an onion approach, uh, security in depth. We must have protection like in the ancient times. You ha must have several, multiple uh, uh, protection measures. None of them by themselves prevent that you are stolen. None of them prevent crime, but it's the combination of all those measures that make things work. As Charles Darwin uh, said, it's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives. It is the one that is the most adaptable to change. But keep in mind, I was fighting alone. I was with the mindset of outrunning the other guy. And this is a battle that no one can take for a long time. It takes a cost on ourselves, on our effort to be able to try to predict. Until 10 years ago, I was introduced to supply chain. I was working private security, but not connected to the supply chain. I run, uh, joined the company, a logistics company, and they said, hey, first thing you're going to do, you're going to do TAPA training, uh, and you're going to join a TAPA conference. And there I understood that each and any one of us is a link in a chain. It's a supply chain in the effective sense of the word. If any link in that chain breaks, we all suffer. It doesn't matter if it's me, if it's my competitor that was doing the stretch before, or the one that's going to, if, as was said today several times, over and over, if the merchandise doesn't get to the end customer, it's not going to, it's a sale that's not going to be replaced. It's a loss that will affect the whole chain because lost money, prices go up, they can't afford to, uh, the same expenses. We all are penalized for this. So we can have a lone wolf approach, yeah. We can take care of our property, but if we are doing it, the issue is we are always fighting everybody. We have to be looking after any attack that comes from anyway, from anywhere. The only other chance is to join the wolf pack. That's the way I like to call it, okay? And this wolf pack, this wolf pack mindset, it's for me, it's TAPA. I'm talking here today as a member of TAPA, representing a company that believes in TAPA, not because of any of the details, not because of any of the components, but because of the whole mindset of what it is to live this lifestyle. I usually say, it's not enough to be in TAPA. TAPA has to be in you. Like was said this morning, you can have a gym membership, great. You can be, you can be a gym uh, member for one year. If you don't show up there, will you get in shape? Will anything get done? No. So to be in TAPA, to feel TAPA, we have three main pillars. The standards, the intelligence, and the network. Okay? Those are the three dimensions of what it means to be tapperized, of what it means to live this uh, concept. Talking about the standards, first thing, pardon my English, but I'm from, I'm Portuguese and it's a bit straightforward. So uh, TAPA standards are not defined by some sages in an ivory tower that know everything. They write it in stone and we all pure mortals have to follow it. TAPA standards, as I'm going to say, are done by the community, for the community. I was audited last week by a very senior German, uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, by a se very senior German auditor uh, doing a very strict TAPA audit. And when we, she was talking to my colleagues, she was explaining, hey, I've been doing TAPA audits for 20 years. And trust me, behind each line of the standard, behind each and every one of the requirements, there's a story behind it. Something happened to someone, to a member of TAPA, that motivated this. Why? TAPA standards are formally reviewed every three years. There's a new version. There was the TAPA standard 2014, 2017, 2020, and now the 2023. 
But as soon as a new version comes out, we start working on the next one. We continue, it's a continuous improvement process. Not done by some, spe you are the specialists. We are the ones in the field. We are the ones being robbed. We are the ones that can share knowledge. So the work groups are composed by members that are in the field, living that reality and share their experiences. And together, by brainstorming, by sharing experiences, trial and error, see which technique works better and decreases risk, that's how they are updated. So basically, each member can, and I dare to say should, be a part of the development of the standards. Share experiences, join the subcommittees that exist for each and every one of the standards. But this, if, if you take anything out of my presentation, take this. The standards are done by you. If any of us finds a thing in the standard, hey, this doesn't apply to me. In my reality, this is not doable. We can have two options. Either we're passive, hey, okay, I cannot apply this, doesn't work, or how can I make this work? What can be improved, what can be changed, what can be added to make this standard better? That's what it means to be tapperized. So, regarding the standard structure, just to give you a glimpse, we're going to talk deeper. I'm going to skip uh, the next part, inclusively. we'll have a presentation on this. But there are three main standards, okay? FSR, TSR, and PSR, facility security requirements, tracking security requirements, and parking security requirements. Basically, a standard for each separate part of the process. As Thornton even mentioned, there's analysis being made with the community. There's going to be um, inquiry done to the members to see if we should implement the, cyber the supply chain cybersecurity standard that specifically how to protect the supply chain cybersecurity. It's not an IT perspective from our view, from our view in the field. But these standards, each is composed by different levels. You have the FSR A, B, and C, each with different levels of requirement. If I have a low risk operation, I go with an FSR C. If I have a high risk operation, I go with FSR A. But the standards are not all. The standards are a framework. Keep in mind, this is the foundation of our operations. It's how we build our setup. TAPA standards are not the facility security requirements, are not just about the facility itself. It's about the whole company. It's about the whole operation. Workforce integrity. How do you vet your employees? How do you do your background checks? What kind of process you have in place to make sure that when you are rehiring someone, you go and check why did he leave in the first place and make sure you're not rehiring a, private, a previous felon. It's in the standard. It's in the requirements. Why? Because it already happened to one of us. And it was decided, it was a good practice, it was a protection to reduce risk to put that in the standards. TSR, for instance, even has uh, different levels within itself. In TSR, 2014, tracking security requirements just had the three levels. 2017, community started to realize, hey, I cannot apply the same type of protection to a um, flat path that I can uh, need to apply to a container transport that I need to apply to another type of transport, to a van. So in 2020, uh, we had for the first time, for each of the three levels, four options. Okay, so you have the tracking security requirements for a hard sided, okay, for a soft sided, for a van, or for a sea container transport. And within each one, the detailed standard on how to give the appropriate level of protection for that type of transport. On top of that, we have enhanced options. Each customer, each operator decides, hey, I want to have the facility security requirements, but I want also to comply with the enhanced option of monitoring center. I want to comply with the enhanced option of cyber protection. And it's all there. What do I need to do? How do I implement? On top of the, 
standards themselves, they provide us the common language. When I'm negotiating with a client, when I'm negotiating with a subcontractor, I don't have to go through all the details of each supplier coming in and asking which cameras do you have. I have a TAPA level, uh, FSRA facility. That's common language. It's easier to negotiate. But of course, as I mentioned several times, TAPA standards are the baseline. There's no golden rule. There's no magic key that protects everything. But they give us the baseline, the foundations, where we can add our own requirements. My company works with tobacco industry. They have TSR1+, plus with their own specific requirements. It works with electronic companies. They have their own requirements. Why? Because the environments are different. So the standard, TAPA standards give us this foundation where to build, how to manage our operations, and then we work from that. And they are complemented. But recently, the last few years, besides the standard, now we have the guidelines. We have the CCTV guidelines. We have the, um, the telematic systems guidance, locking system uh, guidelines. Basically, additional documents that tell us how to do it. Because the TAPA standards are requirements, period. For a TAPA TSR1, you must use a secure lock on your vehicle. But you ask, and what is a secure lock? How can I choose the correct lock? You must have CCTV coverage for identification or for recognition. And you ask, and what type of camera must I choose? Those are guidelines developed again by the community, for the community. Community members get together, volunteer, and share experience on what's the best way to implement a CCTV system on my warehouse, on what's the best way, what are the best current best practices to have a telematic system following my trucks. With these guidelines, we are able to get the standards and make them work, and actually put them in the field. Second pillar, I won't talk much about this because we'll have another presentation dedicated to, uh, to this, but this is in the perspective of the user, of the member, TIS, TALPA Intelligence System. As Thorson said, it's the Google of cargo crime data, and it is. It is the most comprehensive database relating to cargo crime. There, that's where we can find, and we'll show it later, we can find and use information regarding all the cargo crime that's reported. The thing is, we have the possibility to analyze raw data, we have the possibility to view the major numbers, or to interactively work with it, play with it in map. Hey, let me see where do I have false uh, stops, blue lights, uh, events, which areas of the country this happens most often? Where do I have uh, fake uh, pickups, fraudulent pickups? Where do I have violent crimes? Where? Oh, the Romanian tactic, theft in transit. We can go there interactively in the map, sort it out. And we have to, the capability to develop route, route planning. I can plan my route. I can select the type of crime that I'm worried about for the type of merchandise I'm uh, transporting for the type of um, threat that I'm worried about, and then I turn on the heat map. And it shows me in the road in which points there are reported more incidents, and I can detour, I, I can rearrange my route planning in order to avoid the highest risk areas. So we can also detect abnormal patterns and issue alerts to the community. We've just recently received an alert that was an area classified as a secure parking. There was a spike in incident in that area and TAPA immediately informed all members, hey, be careful with this, uh, it's a hot spot, uh, we're looking into it, it's at your own peril to use it, but um, be safe. The third pillar, and for me, one of the most important it's the peer connection, the networking. What you've been doing here in the breaks, as I mentioned before, we can be lone wolves or we can work in a wolf pack. I personally have a motto, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So here, we are all united against a common enemy. The guys that are outside with guns wanting to rob our merchandise. 
from the supply chain. The guys that are looking for the weakest link in the supply chain to target and harm us all. So it's with this networking, with the continued exchange of information, sharing ideas, sharing experiences, it's a priceless resource for us all to get together and help each other reinforce using our accumulated experience. With the establishment of connections, we have a need. I just had a conversation the other day in an event. Someone was looking for a, a logistics service provider in a certain area, couldn't find it, and hold behold, in a TAPA conference, we just found a subcontractor that would su uh, supply us with the requirements we need to continue the supply chain. And we could deliver the cargo knowing that they follow TAPA standards being confident that they follow the same procedures we do. Because, for instance, one of the TAPA standards requirements, and it's a mandatory one, there all are, it's that when you subcontract, you must enforce the same requirements to all the companies that you're subcontracting to. Because it doesn't matter if you deflect the costs. We cannot have the idea, hey, but I subcontracted, so if it gets stolen, it's his insurance that will suffer. Remember, we all suffer. If there is crime, today is him, tomorrow it will be me. Either we group together and work together and make sure these processes are in place, or one of us will fall one at a time. And when we realize, we don't have strength to combat crime. We don't have strength to fight it alone. So, benefits that Rangel as a logistics service provider, has received from being a TAPA member, more than being a TAPA member, of being TAPAized. As I said, it's not to be enough to be in TAPA, TAPA has to be in you. And by believing in this concept, first thing, uh, by the way, is 7,000 euros, so 14 million rents uh, in my numbers. In the first year, I'll be honest, it's half a year, uh, because I joined the company in February, only started uh, applying TAPA standards in July. We reduced 7,000 euros in losses and damages. Because one of the things that enforcing these standards gives you is a better control of how operations work, a better perception of where it has occurred. It's not just it got damaged, it got damaged where, how, by whom? If we started collecting information, if we start analyzing, we are able to work with operations in order to improve processes. Second benefit, reduction in insurance premiums. As soon as you start having less losses, as soon as you start being able to show the insurance companies that you are protected, that you are more resilient, immediately we noticed a significant reduction in the insurance premiums we had to pay for our operations. A facilitated communication with clients and partners. As I mentioned, we stopped having to go to each client, to each partner, and go through an endless checklist of details customized by each client. We just started answering their requirements. It's a TSR1, a TSR3, an FSRA, whatever according to this same language. We all know what we are talking about. When I'm talking to, about the workforce integrity process, all the clients know what it is. We start getting this common understanding. By, in the end, but not least, a strong security empowerment when internally planning the requirements for new facilities or vehicles. It's not Philippe that believes that you must have CCTV in all dock doors. The standard says it. It's not the security manager that decides on the, how the driver must be identified. The standard says it. So when we go as security professionals to our managers, to our uh, CEOs, and start explaining why do we need this investment, it's according to these requirements, because it's proven, it's recognized by the industry. Taking the, all of this in consideration, and with no further ado, let me finish by saying that the question that I ask, as a member, a proud member of TAPA, is not why should you become a member of TAPA, it's how can you afford not to. Thank you all. I don't know if there are any questions. 
Being so, I'm very proud and glad to present our next speaker, uh, Bjorn Hartung, that uh, comes from the Zurich Insurance, and will explain us how can you insurance and security help each other in loss prevention. 